Welcome to the Concordia Publishing House podcast, where we consider everything in the light of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm your host, Elizabeth Pittman. On today's episode, we're joined by Emily Belvery. Emily is going to talk with us about how our study of the Apostles' Creed can deepen our understanding of our triune God and help deepen our faith in Jesus. Emily is the author of the new Bible study, Together We Believe, a study of the Apostles' Creed. Before we start our conversation with Emily, I'd like to thank our friends at the LCMS Foundation for their support of the CPH podcast. Imagine a future where your God-given gifts will continue to benefit your family and faith after you're called home to heaven. The LCMS Foundation can help you create a gift plan so that your assets, things like your retirement accounts, home or land, will leave a lasting impact on the people you love and the ministries that you care about the most. Visit lcmsfoundation.org to learn more about creating your gift plan. Now on to our conversation with Emily. Emily, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So good to be here. Well, we're excited to introduce you to our listeners and to our viewers. You are a new Bible study author for us. So before we really get into the conversation about your new study on the Apostles' Creed, tell our listeners a little bit about your you and your background. Yeah, um, I live in Omaha, Nebraska um, with my husband, Jacob, and our one-year-old, Nora. Um, I was overseas after graduation, missionary overseas, <laughs> served in, in Taiwan and East Asia. Um, and now I continue to work for Mission of Christ Network, my former sending organization um, on the U.S. side. So I help recruit new missionaries and connect churches. That's such a cool thing that you've been able to do. I can't imagine being a recent college graduate and moving halfway around the world to Taiwan to a place where I don't know the language uh, what was your experience like in those early days when you left the familiarity of the U.S. for the mission field? It's very humbling. <laughs> it's <laughs> like becoming a child again, um, not being able to read, needing people to help you order at a restaurant or go to the grocery store or the doctor, or any of that. Um, yeah, I tell people, I think... People in Taiwan would say, oh, you're so independent for leaving home and coming here. Um, or, you know, you have such such courage, such strong faith. And I said it was really a lesson in dependence and recognizing, like in the U.S., we might be able to fool ourselves into thinking we're independent sometimes, even though as Christians, we know we're fully dependent on God. But living cross-culturally, you, you recognize that every day. I, I can only imagine how... I, w- I would be nervous and just the learning and everything that you had to do. Learning Mandarin, was it the equivalent of English as a second language for you? Were you taking just basic courses? How did that work when you got there? Yeah, I had taken one semester at Concordia, Nebraska, uh, just kind of for fun, and then ended up really loving it. Um, a lot of learning once I got to Taiwan was just kind of picking it up as I needed to. I you know, I learned to speak different phrases. Good morning. How are you? I'm American. And I learned to read things like chicken and fish and pork and <laughs> rice and noodles so I could order off a menu. And yeah, so I needed. <laughs> you, you tell you tell the story at the beginning of the Bible study about how it was important for you to learn the Apostles Creed in Mandarin. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was uh, like I wrote, kind of a strange experience to be at the same time that I was learning, I'm an American, um, I was learning conceived by the Holy Spirit and suffered under Pontius Pilate and things I was never going to use in daily language. Um, but I attended a bilingual uh, Lutheran church in Jai and really wanted to be able to speak that creed along with Taiwanese brothers and sisters in worship. Um, and learn, learn faith language. You know, I was in Taiwan to be able to share Jesus with people. And so that kind of vocabulary was a priority for me. I would think that it would be comforting to be able to say it in unison with the folks there at the church in Taiwan, because it is, it does, it does bring us into community with one another here in the church. How hard was that to learn? (laughs) It was, I mean, at that point, just rote memorization, just lots of repeating the same phrases over and over. And 
having very patient teachers to correct my pronunciation. <laughs> well, it's memory work is one thing that we Lutherans do well. And so, you know, at least in our grade schools, there's lots of memory work, so we're used to it. But still in a, a foreign language, I'm sure it was, was a challenge. What was, as you write the, wrote the study, you talk about you have multiple aims in diving deep into the Apostles' Creed. Tell us about those. Yeah, um, it's a study I actually wrote and used first overseas um, with a combination of new Christians and people who are not yet believers. Um, so part of my goal is to address that audience, uh, which I think sometimes churches in the U.S. don't expect to show up. Uh, we just assume everyone's grown up in the church. Um, but there are lots of people who, especially in my generation, didn't grow up going to church, don't have a background of faith, um, or maybe are returning to church after a long time away. Um, and so I did want the study to speak to people coming in with maybe very little ba background in the Bible, um, but wanting to know about the triune God. Uh, but I also hope that for lifelong Christians, it will be a chance to dive deeper into the creed. Um, there's kind of different levels of questions to talk about practical applications and, um, yeah, just some of the diving deeper questions. Well, and I, th I think as our congregations here in the U S but, and I think more and more we are recognizing at least people that I'm talking to are recognizing that people are coming to the church who have not been lifelong Lutherans and have not been raised with every week reciting the creed. This is a great opportunity to bring, new and existing members together and really uh, refresh our understanding of the Apostles Creed and why it's important to us. Yeah, definitely. I think there's probably lots of us who studied it in confirmation and since then have just repeated it week after week without really thinking too much about it. I think that's probably a fair, fair statement. So what benefits are there for us, whether we are new to the faith or we've been doing exactly what you, we haven't touched it since confirmation what benefits do are there for us to dive deep into studying the Apostles' Creed? I think it's just a really helpful summary of what we believe as Christians. Um, I think about when I taught this in Asia, I had one American student in the class who'd grown up in a non-denominational church and hadn't really used the creed growing up. Uh, and she was a little questioning about why are we studying this? Um, and as soon as we got into it, she was like, oh, that's actually really helpful in trying to explain to people who ask, what do you believe as a Christian? And we might think about the entire Bible and be like, I don't know where to start. Well, the creed tells us where to start. That's, that's an overview of what we believe. Um, or people would come to me and say, okay, I'm going to start reading the Bible. Where should I begin? Um, and they start even a gospel and immediately run into so many different questions. But if they can tie it to, to the creed and a summary of what we believe, it gives you kind of an anchor point as you're reading other portions of scripture. So how would you suggest that someone use the creed to kind of witness to someone or to help teach someone about the faith? Where would you start? Um, a lot of the application questions I have through the study sort of assume the questions are coming from someone else. Um, and then the creed gives us a point to go back to um, when somebody asks, you know, why does my life have meaning or why? Uh, maybe even someone who has a common point of saying, I really care about creation and taking care of the earth. Maybe they don't call it creation, but I care about taking care of the earth. And we can say, yeah, I have a common point there because I believe God's the creator of that earth. And that gives it great value. It is neat to see through the questions throughout the study that you, you do a nice job of that, where there are these very tangible questions um, and discussion points where, as you say, if we can help find those commonalities... Um, it gives us a place to start in conversation with one another. Yeah. And if you're feeling overwhelmed by how do I possibly explain to someone what Christians believe, the creed gives us those, those central tenets, and then you can go from there. So tell us, let's, we'll start at the beginning. We'll start with Article 1. What does Article 1 of the creed tell us about God? Um, that he is, is almighty and, and creator and our father. Um, and so I really focus on those those two, the Almighty and Father, um, that he's both, both has all power and has all love and compassion for us. So when, have you seen the phrase father? You know, when I think of father, I think of my dad or I think of, you know, my husband and my kids. 
Have you seen the phrase father um, viewed differently across cultures? Yeah, I think certainly we all bring different, you know, even just what whatever personal relationship you have with father figures in your life is going to affect how you see that. Um, I tell the story in there of reading uh, the story of the prodigal son with my Chinese tutor, um, and she just could not believe this father. Uh, she said, maybe an American father would be like that, but an Asian father never would um, to welcome his son back. And what if he goes and squanders the wealth all over again and embarrasses his father? And um, I, I think that radicalness of what God is as, fa- as father is part of the parable that Jesus meant to trip up his own listeners to say, is that really what a father is? Um, as we see that, that God is greater than any human understanding of father. What did, again, with your students, how did your students react to the concept of prayer um, and Christian prayer and praying to God, the father? Yeah, I, there were certainly points of commonality. Um, A lot of them had a very practical approach to religion of going to Buddhist or Taoist temples to solve problems. Um, So there was a sense of supplication, prayers of request, going to a temple to ask for good exam scores or health or um, success for their family business or whatever sort of thing they were were looking for. Um, So in that sense, I think at first, many of them were like, oh, yeah, you could also pray for our exams. Might as well cover our bases. Let's let's pray to the Christian God. Let's pray at the at the temple and hopefully somebody listens. Um, But the more we talked about it, they, I think, came to realize that our Christian understanding of prayer is much different. Um, It's a um, how to say that, like, in some ways, it almost sounded like a worse answer because I told them, I can't promise God's going to give you what you ask for. Like he's not our servant to command. (laughs) He's our Lord who's above us. Um, But at the same time, I can promise that he is listening and that he cares and that it's not just a business transaction where if you offer the right offering, he'll give you what you're asking for. Um, It's a father who wants to sit and listen to everything that's on your heart. Um, And that I think was what really amazed them that you could pray in any place and you could pray about any topic. There was nothing too small to pray about. Um, You didn't have to be in the right setting, in the right posture with the right offering to be able to talk to God, Um, but that he's, he's always with us and listening. Well, that kind of, you know, if they have the mindset of father as someone who is scary for lack of a better phrase, or who's going to be angry, like I could see how that would be it would, it would be kind of a novel concept that you could talk to him anytime, anywhere about anything, but how refreshing when you realize that you can, I mean, how freeing is that? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So in article two, moving, moving on down through the articles, you know, we're told of the reasons that Jesus came to us. Tell us about those reasons and how your students kind of reacted to some of, to learning that. Yeah. Um, Point out, like John 1 tells us that the word became flesh, um, that the father made himself known to us by sending his son. Um, So Jesus came so that we could know God, um, which I think is something we maybe take for granted uh, in the Christian tradition that, of course, we know things about God and we we know him. Um, But in a lot of religions, there is much more distance between God and people. It's kind of astonishing to think that God would want to be known by us and to make himself known to us. Um, But there's, uh, there is that reality of distance between us and God that on our own, we can't know him. We can't see God's face um, because of our sin. And so Christ also came to reconcile us to God, to bridge that distance that had been created by our own sin um, and to make us holy and acceptable um, so that we can be reunited to our father. The third article, and when we we start talking about the Holy Spirit, this is uh, understanding the Spirit can trip us up, um, even lifelong Christians, um, especially when we start to move into talking about the Trinity. So how does the Creed help us understand who the Spirit is and what the Spirit as part of the Trinity does? 
yeah, we don't really get a lot in the creed about the spirit. Um, as just as it's connected to the church and forgiveness of sins, um, sanctified living, I focused a lot on the spirit's relation to our faith, to being able to trust in Jesus as Lord. Um, and I think that was the most important with my students in helping them see that the faith that they had in Jesus was a gift from God, uh, that they could be sure that they had the spirit in them because they knew and trusted Jesus. And that as they wanted to share their faith with others, that was also a work of the spirit. Um, and I think that's really comforting to us as we seek to share the gospel with others, that the burden's not on us. The spirit is the one who convicts and who changes hearts. And we just, just witness to what we've seen and experienced and know of God. It's it's a, almost a letting go of control. If we we do what we can, mm-hmm. but then we just trust that the spirit has it. And, it, you know, this if we can plant the seed, the spirit's got it. Yeah. And have the humility to realize our own faith is in our doing. It's exactly the spirit too. Exactly. We cannot rely on ourselves. In the creed, we talk about the Holy Christian church and what it, what does it look like for us to be the church? And I, I like how in the study you do go into quite a few questions on this and spend the better part of a full session on it. What does it look like for us to be the church? And how does the creed kind of remind us of that? Yeah, well, I think it's interesting that we say in the creed, I believe in the Holy Christian Church. Um, you can certainly say I believe in the Holy Spirit because I don't see him. Uh and in the truest sense, we don't see the church either, even though we see buildings and we see the members sitting next to us. Um, I think it does take faith to say the church is Christ's body, that God is living among his people and he's working his will. He's reconciling people to himself. He's proclaiming the gospel and forgiveness of sins through human beings, even though what we see on the outside is often so much more messy of whether that's broken buildings and broken people. Um, yeah, we don't get to live it out perfectly, but but the church itself is sanctified by Christ and is presented without spot or blemish. Um, what that looks like is such a huge question. Um, but I think I really focus on some scriptural images of the body of Christ, um, Jesus at work in the world through human beings, uh, the bride of Christ being chosen by God and reconciled um, and and made holy by Christ. That is just such a beautiful image. Um, one of those relationships in life that you're not born into, but you specifically choose the person that you want to marry. Um, and, and God has chosen us together as his people. Um, and, and a holy building, a place where God lives, uh, not our individual denomination or our individual church building, but the people of God across the world. Well, it's a beautiful thing when we sit and think about it that, you know, as part of the Holy Christian Church, we're joined with all of these believers and we're all part of God's, you know, his church. And it's so much bigger than what we just see on a Sunday morning. Um, And it's really kind of cool when you think about it, whether it's, you know, local people here in your hometown or your students in Taiwan, we're all confessing through the creed the same faith, um, you know, praising our, for our Lord. Yeah. I remember my first Easter in Asia, someone talking about that we got to be at the beginning of a wave of worship that was spreading around the world. And I think about that now on Sundays as y'all even get messages from, from church friends who are starting their worship as I'm going to bed on Saturday night. But that, that's cool. Like the wave of worship. That's a really cool image. It's spreading around the world. Mm-hmm. That That's a really neat image to think about and we're all part of it in our own special place yeah so as we as we start to wind down how do you picture groups using the study how do you envision to be used and what are your hopes for the people who pick up the book yeah i think it can be used in a lot of ways um there's plenty of leaders notes and materials that anyone could pick it up um I taught it as a a church Bible study, um, so it could certainly be used on a Sunday morning, um, whether that's with a pastor or a lay leader. Um, But it also could, I think, lend itself very well to small group study. Um, I hope that it prompts a lot of discussion and thought. I even have notes to the leader that it might make you uncomfortable, and that's okay. (laughs) But I hope it allows students to 
ask questions and to really wrestle with things. Um, and not that the leader feels like they have to have all the answers, but that we can trust that scripture does have the answers and that we can seek God's wisdom together. Well, and it's, it's a great refresher for us, for those of us that it's been many years since we've gone through confirmation, or if we haven't touched on the creeds in our, our Bible study and worship, it's a great chance to dig back into it in a, in a fresh way um, and really, really think about the questions. So we're excited to see it release. Um, thank you for writing it. And for our listeners, if you visit the link in our in the show notes, you'll be able to head over to the webpage and you can preview the study, download a sample. Um, and I just encourage you to check it out and, and let us know what you think. Emily, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Listeners, again, visit our visit the link in our show notes to learn more about Together We Believe, a study of the Apostles' Creed, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Concordia Publishing House podcast. I pray that this time was valuable to your walk with Christ. We'd love to connect with listeners on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Concordia Pub. Visit cph.org for more resources to grow deeper in the gospel.